So I'm here to introduce our next uh, speakers, um, Michael Winslow and Sean Winslow. And uh, Michael comes to us uh, from Comcast, where he is a distinguished engineer and um, executive director. Mike is a dedicated um, technical strategist and people leader there. And Sean comes to us. Um, he's a founding partner and CEO at 2030 Software Solutions. And has a distinguished career um, in the pharmaceutical and sciences space. We have a great talk coming up. But a, just a quick note, um, I've known Mike, Michael for several years. Um, we've worked together um, as co-workers at my previous company. And I am not only a better leader, um, but also a better person for um, that time that we spent together. We spent a lot of time working in similar communities like the DevOps space um, and other community development um, over those years. So please give a warm welcome to Michael Winslow and Sean Winslow. Mic check, mic check. Hey everyone, how you doing? Hey. All right, so real quick question for the audience here. Uh, how many people in the audience have siblings? All right, how many people are the youngest? All right, I, that's my team right there. That's my team. <laughs> See if you got any friends out there. <laughs> well, this big, big brothers, big oh. sisters. All right. <laughs> that seems like almost even right there. Um, so uh, enjoy this talk. Uh, my brother, Sean, and I, this is the first time we're on stage together. Um, but I, I think you'll uh, enjoy the energy. It's, it's, it's a very loose format, and it's a format that we want to make sure that uh, we get a lot of engagement from the audience. So. I'm going to talk about a, a quick rule of something that we're going to do here. Um, how many people saw the Ignite Talks last night, yesterday? All right, yeah, Ignites are great, right? We're taking it one better. We're doing our whole 30-minute talk as an Ignite. All right, so we're, 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 we're scared, but at the same time, we know you're going to help us get, get through it. So what I did was at the end of each of our uh, talking points with the slides, we're going to throw a little uh, lightning uh, up, in the, up in the corner. And if we could just practice something real quick, can everybody take their armrest and just kind of like pat them like this? Yeah. That'll let us know that, that it's time to slow down, get ready to get uh, ready for the next topic. Um, and we'd really appreciate that help from you because we're going, we're going to look my no hands. Once, we, once I click on this next slide, it's going to be uh, automated all the way through. Um, so uh, I think it's time to get started, right? Let's, let's get this started. Let's get this started. I still wanted the intro music. I guess we're not going oh, to. Sorry about that. So who's All right. Sean? Oh, introductions. <laughs> I'm Sean Winslow. I am the founding partner for a company called what we like to call 2030 because we want to be the next Kleenex. Right? Uh, 2030 Consulting is how we started out. We specialize in implementations of all types of software, specifically for life sciences. That's pharmaceutical, medical device companies, uh, and contract organizations that support them. And that's what I've been doing my entire career. Uh, built a company, sold the company back in 2015, and went off and launched this consulting company. Uh, and loving every second of it. And we were working on this last night, which is typical what I think of DevOps. Like we're, we're working on it at midnight, this presentation, and here we are delivering it today. That doesn't work in life sciences. We're gonna talk about that. And he took most of my time. I got five seconds. I'm Mike Winslow. Maybe some of you know me. I'll get through the rest of the intro later. <laughs> so that's in production right there. Hey, Sean, just take a look at that screen right there. You'll have a better idea of uh, when it's time to switch. Yeah. So why don't you tell them a little bit about uh, yeah. how we yeah. So for my fifth birthday, uh, I wanted a dog. And I went to the pet store and I picked out a Siberian Husky and I named it Bobo because Bobo the Clown was the thing back then. That became a family trait. We had like 50 Huskies at a given point in time because my father adopted it as a, as a hobby. He started racing them. Yeah, and, and here we go. Five years uh, younger than Sean at all times. He was always the big, cool brother around here. I'm sure at this point he was eating my food because I was very picky <laughs> and he ate everything. <laughs> And this is years of just growing up. And uh, yeah. uh, we were telling this story at dinner the other day about our, our meeting with Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest guys you could ever meet. 
Yeah. We met him by chance. We said, hey, can we take a picture with you? And he says, well, I'm kind of busy right now entertaining, but why don't you sit down and eat with us? <laughs> and next thing you know, we're sitting at his table, we're getting served drinks, and he's having a great time. Fantastic guy. All right, so that's a little bit about us, uh, you know, ind individually or as brothers. Now we're going to do a fun thing where Sean is going to say. When did when I, I was a know he would be a technologist? Well, back in the very early 80s, uh, I don't know, that was quick. <laughs> no, no, it's still, uh, still Okay, er, er, early, early 80s, uh, my brother would go over to his friend's house. We didn't have computers in my neighborhood, right? It just, it just didn't exist. But uh, in the next neighborhood over, or two or three neighborhoods <laughs> over, he had a friend who had a computer. He would come home every day with these graph papers and these pictures, and, he's, and, he's, and I have no idea what he's doing with them, but he would go and he'd come back with new graph papers every day. And he's like, oh, and he'd have these computer magazines that he would get from the kid's father. And, and yeah, so these are some of the graph paper, the actual graph papers he would come. And he was designing programs where we barely knew what a computer was, right? So from that point, we knew. And I remember one year, my father, who we didn't see much, he was a my name is, I'm named after Sean Connery because my dad was a big 007 fan and went, out, went to be a GS-14, like reported almost directly to the president. He became a top secret guy, so we never heard from him. Except one day he drops off a computer. He didn't drop it off. He actually had it delivered. <laughs> we didn't see him. There's a computer that shows up, and next thing you know, Michael's a computer programmer. All right, thank you for that, Sean. It brought back some good memories. So when did I know that my brother was gonna be a technologist? So having that information about, I got started really early, never thought my brother would be a technologist. He was a high school jock. He was the cool guy that I looked up to all the time, wished I could be like him. But I knew he would be a leader because the amazing things that I would- Hip hop. See, <laughs> yeah, the, the amazing things that I uh, would never uh, think about. So this is a group of his friends that he took down to Kmart. He organized them to go to Kmart with all the women with the babies taking pictures and said, we are going to take a picture with the big boombox radio that, that, that you owned that was a part of our thing. And, you know, they all came along. They all got dressed up. That wasn't something you just saw somebody do. So in our environment, he was already shown, showing that he was going to be a leader. All right. And then after he graduated, it's still no signs of technology. What it, what I, he went and joined the Air Force. Thank you for your service. Uh, he was in uh, Desert Storm, you know, during that time while I was in high school. And he came back so disciplined, so everything. Such a great big brother when he came back because he really invested in me uh, as a technologist. So after he actually uh, came back, he was a leader in a, a, a like lab core or something like that and was in charge of like 50 people. And so he was already on his way to be this, uh, this great leader. And then all of a sudden he turned around and he saw that me as an intern in college was making more than him and he was in charge of 50 people. And he said, I think I need to get into this tech stuff. I was in the wrong business. You know, he was in the wrong business. <laughs> so we tried by, by making him a programmer like me, but that really didn't work. I became work. a paper programmer. Yes, so many people <laughs> talk about how do you break into tech? You gotta realize that there's different ways. What we found out was he was a good tech manager. All right, because being around me, being around a technology person and helping me create stuff, we found out that he'd be a great tech manager. And being and able to push around the little brother. Yeah, push Do around this. the little brother thing. <laughs> All right, so what is thank you for that. So, Sean, why don't I, uh, why don't I give you a little 101 on DevOps, all right? So clearly, DevOps is a set of practices that combines dev and ops, right? We love to describe it that way. This is how Wikipedia said it, but I'm going to tell you right now, in a second, you're going to see the red line that is how I feel. No, <laughs> there's so many other things in there, but the rest is pretty good. It aims to shorten the system development life cycle uh, by providing continuous delivery and high software quality. That's certainly a way that I like to describe it. And DevOps is complementary to agile software development. Um, in fact, it uh, started at an Agile conference where uh, infrastructure people said, you got this Agile thing, but you're leaving us out of the picture, all right? 
So we like to move fast. So as, as a way to kind of set the room, set the context a little bit, I wanted to uh, school Sean a little bit on DevOps. And this happens a lot at family dinners or the bars, as, as he likes to say, <laughs> um, where we kind of set, set the record straight. And then he sets the record straight with me and tells me about a lot of acronyms and words that are in his uh, you know, world to basically get me, give me an idea of what he deals with in technology all the time versus this love for DevOps that I picked up eight years ago. So uh, probably on the, uh, in a minute, I didn't realize I gave myself this much time to talk, but I can talk about DevOps all day. I believe it's about moving software from idea to production faster without losing quality. You ask me at any time of day, day or night, sleepy or awake, I will have a good definition for you. Um, and I learned so much of what I know uh, about DevOps from my man Nathan Harvey right here. And I want to take this time to also say that our mother's name is Dora. So be real careful when you say you love Dora, okay? Be real careful. Oh, man. I really gave myself a long time. You did, yeah. I, <laughs> and full disclosure, I, we've never done this over dinner. It's, it's really drinks. It's really drinks. So it, it may be, it, we thought this would be a good idea because we're normally drinking when we have this conversation. But yeah. it may not be that good now that we're, you know, halfway sober. Uh, yeah. I'm probably going to walk over. I know when I walk over, I'm going to get the lightning bolt. I'm just going to go ahead and move to your slide. Well, just the, the one thing on the DevOps that when I saw this definition for the first time today, I saw this definition. <laughs> You're next. We're, we're, yeah, we're bridging over uh, the whole from dev to IT. Right. I represent IT, but ultimately there's, a, there's that other part, and that's the customer. And for life sciences, the customer is the patient, the person popping that pill in their mouth or putting that heart defibrillator, you know, the, uh, the heart monitor uh, inside their body. Right. That's who our customer is, and that's who we care about. Right. So from going from dev to IT ops, it's like, OK, are we missing out on that end consumer, the person who's actually using the end product? And how's that affect them? But we have our own acronyms that you'll probably hear me splurt out. Um, we have something called good auto, automated manufacturing. So we're not against automation. We love automation. Right. Um, the problem is we have to go through what we call GXP, good practices. In other words, we want to know that you had an intention and you validated that intention. You, you tested it over and over again before you moved it into production. And when you tested it, you had production parity, right? So what we use in production, we want to know that you tested that yesterday before we roll it into production. And we want to know step by step how you're rolling it in. So when we say GXP, we're talking about good practices and there's a lot of X's, manufacturing, clinical, laboratory, whatever division of life sciences you work in. And we have this thing called the V model. And Gamp came up with this V model. It's how we test everything. Right? On the left-hand side of the V model, you have your requirements, your func functional specs, your config specs. And the bottom line is we have auditors. Big Brother is always watching. For us, Big Brother is the FDA or the EMA in Europe. And they're always watching. And guess what? They don't read the matrix. Right? They need to see something in easy, readable format. So we have Word documents still that shows you that we've tested everything. Right? And that's part of the, one of the challenges we have to get into when we're talking about moving DevOps into highly regulated environments. Yeah, awesome. And uh, I, I want to quote a, a famous Philadelphian here. Uh, has anybody heard of Kevin Hart before? <laughs> Kevin Hart. And I'm going to say, you just threw a lot of acronyms at me. <laughs> and since I don't understand them, I'm going to take them as disrespect. You know, I'm going <laughs> to... So... Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I will acknowledge that I, I'm not in your space. I, you know, I'm not in life sciences. Right. But I can't imagine uh, based off of what I've seen in all the industries that I have been in, there's always been pushback. And I also see heavy uh, regulated industries that are making the move. A lot of healthcare, banking, finance, all that stuff. They are making the move. So, uh, you know, I, I do push a little bit hard with life sciences to say, you know, don't 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 stand too far behind. So so let me quickly ask you. I got, I got a couple of numbers in my head. I believe Amazon is quoted as as uh, doing a deploy every 12 seconds. All right. Netflix thousands of deploys a day. Etsy um, I think at least 50. That's that's kind of what, what they're going with. Doesn't that excite you? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I, I, I don't even know how to respond to something like that because <laughs> at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm always scared that something is going to be manufactured or a label on the medication that you pick up off the counter is going to be incorrect. And it's going to be incorrect because the smallest mistake was thrown into the production environment and that label was printed off. So representing the users, the business, I represent the business who re represents the end consumer, right? We need to make sure everything is right. So when you pass that over from dev to IT and IT says, okay, we're ready to give it to you, it's, it's great. Get a copy of our production, throw it in production, and we're gonna go through all kinds of performance qualifications and user acceptance testing before we roll it into production itself. And that takes time. Now, if you can prove to me that you've tested all that in a validated manner, right, and you can show me the documentation, then I might say go ahead and roll it in. Also keep in mind, Life Sciences is a big building. There's GXP, which means you have to follow these good practices that are regulated by the government, and there's non-GXP. So there are non-GXP activities where we can roll th things through. It takes 10 to 15 years to get the concept of a drug to market, right? If you could shave off one year of that time, you're making your, the pharmaceutical industry millions of dollars, but more importantly, you're getting that drug out one year faster, or you're getting that whatever's gonna help support somebody to have a better life. Ultimately, in life sciences, that's what we care about. So we're open to DevOps. The problem is, we, no, you don't understand our culture is how we feel. You don't understand our culture that we really got to protect that patient for a lot of different reasons, right? And so come over, let's, let's have a class on GXP and GAMP so that you can tell me how you're going to satisfy our problem but following these regulations. I Who can do that? <laughs> Anyone? And, and it's not just life sciences, aeronautical. Do you want to fly an airplane knowing that it wasn't properly tested in a, in a real production environment? No, you don't want to be on that, a passenger on that plane, right? Um, uh, uh, Marianne, was Marianne in the room? She was talking about, you know, defense mechanisms, right? I mean, God, if I launch a missile, I don't want it coming back at me, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, it, it, anywhere you have these highly regulated environments, this is what we care about, the end result, right? Gotcha. And hearing you talk about culture that way, you know, I, I don't want to get political, but I don't care about your culture. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, fair. It, it's, it's fair. I heard you say something about... GXP, good practices, and non-GXP. And this is, this is what I've thought about when I've heard uh, you speak about it over the years. Yes, there is a lot of things, products that you put out in your industry that affect people's lives, drugs, uh, machinery that they use to stay alive, and things like that. It makes sense. But there's also payroll systems, and there's, and, and there's things like that. And it seems to me like your industry uh, still is very tight, even in systems like that. that mm -hmm. Would those be the ones that are considered non-GXP? Some of them. I mean, you still have, they would be non-GXP, but if you're talking finance, right, there are regulations for finance systems, right? But you're right, culture is a problem, and it's, it's a problem and it's, it's a good thing too, right? But because of our culture, our testing goes back to testing the medication that's going into somebody's mouth or the device that's going into somebody's body. So because that's our culture, we automatically just think, you know, every, we see a nail, every, you know, we have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So it doesn't matter if it's non-GXP or GXP. I'm so tempted to put it through a full validation cycle, even if it's not going in, you know, causing a drug to go into somebody's mouth. So that's a culture thing that sometimes you kind of got to pull us along to say, hey, you did say this, this doesn't really impact the clinical pipeline, right? This, this impacts, uh, you know, who's going to order the food today for lunch, right? <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's not as critical, but we still want to test the hell out of it, right? That's just because it's our culture. Got you, got you. You're, you're in a unique position um, to, for this talk because you own a company 
that sells to the pharmaceutical industry. So it's important for you to not necessarily be about changing their culture. It's important for you to get sales and speaking their language. Yes. Um, if you were to sell to somebody uh, in that industry, could you push the DevOps concept if you were to say, I, I want to target some of your non-GXP work and, and bring DevOps in that way? Would that be a good way to go in? From a services standpoint, yes. And don't mistake, DevOps does live to some extent within highly regulated environments. It's the culture challenge that you're still dealing with. And the, the, the restriction end of it, the, where we're so tight, it's kind of casting a shadow on the rest of DevOps in, in our world. You do bring up a good point, though. Uh, this morning, Marianne was uh, talking about uh, COT solutions and how everybody's trying to back end requirements into a COT solution. Well, our company goes through that all the time. And about a year ago, we decided after doing the same project over and over again, we decided we could actually develop software that solves this problem as opposed to re-engineering everybody's COT solution, which is always a one-time fix. And so we came up with a product called I Am Qualified, which meets a certain regulation within life sciences and we're getting ready to release 1.0 very soon. And we know that what that means. It means the next day we're gonna to have to release 1.01, right? And then 1.1. And our customers are gonna be very eager to get it quickly. So we're trying to figure out how do we implement DevOps into our own company and our own, so, so we, and we wanna go into the life science industry and say, yes, we're gonna sell you 1.0 today, we're gonna to implement it. And yeah, we're gonna be able to implement those fixes tomorrow. And guess what? It's fully validated fixes, right? We want to be able to hit that milestone. So I'm glad I have so many DevOps evangelists in the room because I'm going to need your help on this. So, <laughs> so uh, about that, so you, so, so you go sell this solution. You understand that it's a non-GXP, at least, uh, I, I, I believe, solution. Do you still, because of the culture that exists there, do you put anything like in the marketing of your product, anything like five nines or anything just because it kind of increases your chance? Do you feel like that you need to do that because of the industry? At, at this time in the life cycle, I, five nines is a expectation <laughs> more than a discussion, right? You know, no one even brings it up. It's probably in the requirement that, oh yeah, our systems are up five nine, we have triple redundancy, everything's there. And we just kind of push that to the side. Nobody really looks at it. But if somebody does look at it, it's like, wait a minute, how are you doing five nines with just one environment? Or, you know, uh, so no, we don't, we don't talk about it too much, but it's there. Like we all know, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, that's, that's all great. Here's, here's uh, one thing I hear. I hear that the industry is very risk averse, yet if I watch a commercial for just about any drug, there's two minutes of bad things that can happen to you, right? <laughs> like, give me a little bit of that process. Like, like, if you're willing to, you know, risk and put something out there, yeah. For that, like, what is the process that's so different than, you know, being being somebody who's a DevOps person that says, hey, we, we plan for a little bit of failure, but we want to recover from it. What's yeah. the big difference? So, so this, this is probably the number one lesson you can take away from this discussion, right? <laughs> Highly regulated environments are all about risk. What is the risk? Like he said, you watch your TV commercial at the end and, oh, yeah, it will, it will save you from a heart attack, but it will cause diarrhea, your hair will fall out, you'll gain weight, you'll lose weight. Everything will go wrong with you, but you won't die, right? <laughs> and so there's these risks. And this, the same thing happens when we're doing software implementations. They want to know what is the risk of this being a problem, right? And if you have that conversation with your end consumer, they'll let you in. They'll say, okay, sit down. Let's talk. So speak their language. Speak their language. Speak yeah. their language. All right. So that's great. I've loved this format so far. It's been definitely been keeping us uh, on on task. Is that 30 minutes already? No, it's not. It's not. We left uh, quite a bit of time for Q&A, um, but can also talk more. Uh, for the audience, uh, do we have any questions for my man here from the regulated industry or for DevOps in general questions from me? Okay, real quick uh, repeat, 
Uh, the last speakers just talked about error budgets. What is the similar concept uh, in your industry of the idea mm -hmm. of error budgets, a certain um, allowance mm -hmm. of errors? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. And right at this moment, the term that we use in life science is escaping me. But there is a science, uh, an algorithm that they use, a mathematical equation that they use that they, the genesis was on drug manufacturing. Right? No drug that gets to your counter is 100% clean. Right? There's, there's particles in there, there's all kinds, and that's all based on risk. You know, how, how, how much dirt is okay you know, before it starts killing you? And so they have what they, some kind of uh, calculation that they use, um, and it varies between product. Right. And I can't remember the name of that calculation right now, but I will I will post it. Yeah, <laughs> I will go, I'll go back and look it up. But yeah, um, the problem is, like I said, the culture is it started with drugs and a lot of things we do in the drug environment has made its way into the IT environment. And so even though it may not have a perfect room for it, it should it may not belong there. Right. But we use it anyway. Right? We use, it's, basically, it's a standard deviation of errors and what we allow. So you've heard it here first, the urban legend that you eat one spider a year in your Captain Crunch is true. So <laughs> any other questions? Oh, back there. Okay, cool. That's, that's not a question, but I'm loving to, I, I want to talk about that. You reminded me of something that, uh, that, I, that I meant to mention earlier, so thank you. Uh, so, so he said, there's a lot of um, toil, basically, around the documentation that needs to get created uh, for this industry, and it's, a, it's an opportunity to automate those things that slow us down. Um, and, and he did say this is for both of us, so, I, so I'll, I'll take this first. Um, when we were talking about this, we thought about one step that, that, that we in, in my industry and, and many of the DevOps implementations that I've seen so far have not really taken into account. And uh, validated systems need to also have associated SOPs and new training uh, involved with it. So what's the DevOps solution to say, you, you're, you're moving fast, you're making a bunch of changes to my application, but does that spawn off new training documentation, new, uh, you know, and, and new SOPs that have to be adhered to every year? And I'm not positive I've seen a, a good solution for that. There's no way that we, we would want the most minor of change to basically mean everybody in your company has to take a new training of it. So uh, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, and great idea. The problem is somebody looks at that and they see all the domino effects, everything that spawns from that. And in a perfect world, we'd have exactly what you're suggesting. But that automated testing also has to be validated. So you need a validated automated testing process for every automated test sequence you, you run it through. Right? And when an auditor comes in, they're going to say, oh, I see you're using automated testing here, here, and here. Let me see the SOPs that you use to execute that automation. Let me see the validation that, that went through so that we know that your results are all as expected and intended. And somebody looks at that and says, OK, we need to get this drug out you know, in the next six months. We don't have time for that. And it just gets tabled and kicked down the road over and over again. But if somebody has the right investor and can go develop all that end to end, they will be the next billionaire. No doubt about it. Great. Um, hey, hey. <laughs> well, to some extent, yes, there would be. Um, there are, once the FDA gives you the ability to fast track something, right, that's, that's two things. Number one, we always say this, whether we mean it or not, we want to help the public. Right? We want to solve the COVID problem. Uh, number two is dollar signs. 
right? Let's get this drug out. So let's reprioritize everything we're doing. And that's why, that's why you're able to take something that would make, you know, with go, the COVID vaccine not getting too technical, but it, it's not like we just started working on the COVID vaccine you know, yesterday. I mean, we started this seven, eight years ago. We started using those as what we did seven, eight years ago for a different problem. We use that as a boilerplate for COVID, right? So, so that's one of the reasons we're able to speed up the process. But um, the, what are we going to learn from this? We don't know, right? We, we hear about these stories all the time where five years later, you know, lawsuits are popping up everywhere because something went wrong. But a good thing you should know, if, if Emergent, which is uh, right out here in Baltimore, right, Emergent um, uh, basically had to destroy millions and millions and millions of COVID vaccines. Nobody even knows if there was anything wrong with it, but somebody skipped a step in a procedure, right? I think it was a cleaning issue. Like they, didn't, they didn't properly clean or something like that. And so they had to destroy all those batches. And you know what? We don't take chances. Right. We don't want we don't want covid vaccines that are supposed to help you going into you. That's actually going to hurt you because somebody didn't follow a procedure. So these rules are in place for a good reason. Again, it's how do we understand those rules, understand our culture, understand our regulation, understand how we have to comply. Come talk our language. Right. Because that's exactly what we need to do to make this work. We want DevOps. We want to go from 15 years to five years to get a drug to market. Right. Because. We can, we can help people faster if we can do that. Cool. Yeah. Oh. So, I mean, the, something you mentioned there was that in the development of the COVID vaccine, you were using uh, a boilerplate process that you had used on previous problems. And within, within DevOps and software development, uh, that's something that you also have to take a look at. That that's something that we do as well. That very often we will take a program or something that we, we've written before and we will make adjustments to Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that can help get over some of this hesitancy over it, because that we're, we're using a similar process there. We call it copy-pasta. Copy-pasta. <laughs> yeah, sir. If, if what you did before was validated, yeah, definitely. Bring it. Show us, show us the evidence that you validated this as a repeatable process. Yeah. Right? And then let's put it through change control. Right, where we do all the proper testing and make sure before we add this change to production that we're controlling that change to production. Again, it's, it's about the language and the culture, right? There's nothing that you guys are doing that probably we aren't doing too. We're just doing it knowing that Big Brother is watching and they're gonna come scrutinize every step because they know what we're doing, whether it's pharmaceuticals, medical device, aeronautical, whatever somebody's life is at risk, right? And we don't want people dying because we just didn't follow a good controlled procedure. Yeah, that's, that's great. And he, and he taught me uh, the term, what, configuration over customization, right? That's, yeah. that's the idea. If you can build a configurable system over a custom system, then you can skip yeah, some absolutely. steps in validation. All right, thank you, everyone. Right. I really appreciate you. Thank you, guys. It was great. Thank you.